Dylan from Prairie Grove, Arkansas. What is your personal opinion on the current climate debate and man's role in affecting the environment? How do you reconcile your views with scripture and the claims of popular scientists? Well, that's a lot. That last part of the question, how do I reconcile? I'm not sure I'm very good at reconciling that, but I can tell you how I try to think it through. And so Dylan, I would say that in, in terms of climate change, I am very much aware of the fact that climate changes. Uh, it's just changed about 30 degrees in Louisville, Kentucky in the last 48 hours. I know that, that that's not what we're talking about here, but one of the problems is we don't know what we're talking about. So climate changes all the time. What's discussed as climate change now is in the context of a, of a claim that there's a pattern to, uh, to climatological changes that can be traced to human activity. Now, I'm also gonna tell you, that's plausible to me. It, it really is. Uh, in other words, I'm a skeptic of a lot of the current claims made by what's called the, the, the climate science or the scientific consensus. But just trying to be a thinking Christian, I can tell you, it makes sense to me that, uh, that given the scope of human activity since the Industrial Revolution, it's entirely possible that we are bringing about some changes in the, uh, in, in, in the, the created order that would bring about some changes in the climate. I, I do question the ability of climate scientists, as they're known, uh, to retrospectively come up with all kinds of arguments about the climate when there were no records being kept. And quite frankly, this is a, it's, a, it's quite an arguable proposition that they actually know what the climate was like in the year 823 in France. Uh, th there may be some evidence I can draw up from a glacier or something, but you know, let's face it, it's, it's really hard to apply that the same way we would apply the figure that comes from, uh, say, uh, uh, taking someone's blood pressure. That's not the same kind of mathem mathematical formula right now. So I, I really, I, I don't deny that there could be some human influence, but there has also been tremendous gain. I mean, the, in the 19th century, let me recommend a book for you, Richard Evans, The Pursuit of Power, Europe, 1814, I believe, 1815 to 1914. It's, uh, it's on a list I'm just about to release in, in the next few hours of, uh, of recommended books for the end of the year. Richard Evans is not writing as a Christian. He's writing as a professional historian. This is the new volume in the Penguin History of Europe. But one of the things he points out is that in the 19th century, with the two waves of the Industrial Revolution, came pollution, yes. Came urbanization, yes. Came all kinds of things that we can document, yes. But also came antibiotics. Uh, also came the rise of the modern hospital. Also came not only air conditioning, but refrigeration that has, has saved many lives. The flushing toilet, uh, may, maybe in terms of technology, that which has saved the most human lives of any invention. And by the way, that came in the 19th century and aren't you glad of that? So you look at this and you recognize that the Industrial Revolution brings all kinds of things. Um, and, and some of them no doubt bring some ecological challenges. But I, you know, I, I, I think that uh, the, the right approach to this is understanding there's gonna be a trade-off. And, and, and stewardship, by the way, which is the biblical category, it's always about understanding how to achieve the right kind of, of trade-off and stewardship um, between gain and loss. And, uh, and so I'll be honest, I, I find many people who are pushing the current supposed scientific consensus uh, to have a basic anti-human worldview. They see human beings as a blight on the planet. The biblical worldview doesn't allow that at all. Go forth and multiply. And, uh, and also in historical awareness, would remind us of the fact that a lot of the arguments being made by these climate scientists uh, today are very similar to the arguments made by people like uh, Thomas Malthus and others in the 19th century who said, you know, the earth can't possibly feed all the people who are alive and will be alive at the end of the 19th century. Well, you know, that's true without the Industrial Revolution, which in terms of the ability to produce massive crops on a massive scale has meant that We've eradicated famine in much of the world. And, uh, and, and so we don't want to undo that. And, uh, and we can't see human beings as a blight. Uh, the, the other thing is that in this kind of trade-off, we're gonna have to understand, um, we should really hope for technological innovations that will help us a great deal. And, and we're already seeing that in many different ways. Uh, but there's gonna, be a, there's gonna be a cost and benefit analysis to every one of these technologies. And uh, so there's some great policy debates to be had here. And, and I, I think the change of administrations in the White House is gonna to lead to a very vigorous conversation about this. And uh, I'll be honest, I think the uh, previous administration has, uh, 
has has and and many in the in the the cultural elites in this country have pushed climate change as an agenda for many other things that frankly have nothing to do with anything that might have any meaningful change in the environment, but rather uh, is is an excuse for uh, a, a new Malthusianism, a, a, a new effort to try to limit human population uh, based upon the same kind of claims were made back in the 19th century. And, uh, and quite frankly, restrictions on human freedom and, uh, and other things that I, I, I think are very dangerous. I don't see human beings as a blight upon the planet. That, that is not biblical, that's anti-biblical. But remember in Genesis 1 verse 28, we are told that we have a dominion mandate as, as stewards of the earth. We are to, uh, we're to subdue the earth and, and that means we have to be good stewards. We're gonna answer to God for this garden uh, to use another metaphor that we have received by His grace in terms of planet Earth. Uh, but a good steward is one who puts it to use, puts it to work. Just remember Jesus' parable of, of, of the stewards. Um, it's, it's the good steward who, uh, who puts what's invested to him to work and tends it well and returns it with an increase. If we return this earth uh, that, God, that God made and declared good, if we return it sullied and and dirtied and depleted and ruined, uh, that will be a horrible misuse of stewardship. Uh, it would also be a misuse of stewardship to say, hey, what we need to do is just let nature take over. Uh, that's disastrous. Uh, and, and also it's, it's completely unrealistic and it, uh, it sees human beings as the problem. Instead we say, we need to say, we need to be good stewards of the earth. We need to take advantage of every good thing and try to limit every negative uh, dimension or impact. And it is going to be a trade-off. If you're going to have a car, you're going to have exhaust. But uh, the next time you call 911, you're going to want some internal combustion engine uh, to come with lights flashing on top. It's just intellectual honesty to say, there's a cost-benefit analysis here, and a good steward takes both into account. The other thing is this, 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 uh, I, I talked about on the briefing just this morning, I think it was, um, uh, no, it was yesterday, actually. Uh, 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 Washington Post editorial on the uh, quote settled science and it, it, it's a political argument that's presented as a scientific argument. I have great respect for science that is defined according to its proper limits but when you have the editorialists of the Washington Post uh, uh, opposing uh, the current nominee uh, to be head of the Environmental Protection Agency, that was a friend of mine and, and, a, and a trustee of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary uh, the current Attorney General of, of uh, Oklahoma, Scott Pruitt, and, and opposing him because they said he, he questions the settled science. Well, let me just point out, no advance in human history has ever been made that didn't question what was then the settled science. If, we, if we're not supposed to question the settled science, uh, then we're, we're going to be doing surgery like the ancient Greeks, and I'm not signing up for that.